Calculating condyle movements. The purpose of this video is to consider what happens in the following situation. We see the jaw here, it is rotating shut, and we come to an interference so that the teeth don't completely close. There's a point of contact on one of the back teeth. We're looking at a situation where the jaw is fully seated in centric relation, and then when the patient is asked to squeeze, we see the jaw sliding and rotating so the teeth come fully together in maximum intercuspation. And so what we're going to look at is if all that we know is what happens to the teeth and we have an idea of where the cond condylar axis is relative to the teeth, then can we figure out where the condylar axis goes? So in moving from a point of first contact in centric relation into maximum, maximum intercuspation, looking at the teeth, what can we conclude about the motion of the axis? The foundational principle on which the mathematics that I'm going to show you is based is that points in a rigid object maintain their relative positions. So what we're looking at here is a side view of the condyle and I realize that we're just dealing with it as a two-dimensional as if it is a two-dimensional object and that is fine as long as the slide that we're considering is symmetrical that is the same on the right and left side of the jaw. Now, I realize that most slides are not symmetrical but to keep the math easy we're just going to look at the symmetrical case. Now I've marked three points on this condyle I realize they're more blobs than points but I've made them big so that you can see them. Uh, so the three points are the condylar axis up here, first point of contact on a lower rear molar, and a point of contact on one of the front teeth. And the principle that I'm illustrating here is that if we move this object around and we're in PowerPoint, so what I'm going to do is use PowerPoint, this uh, size and position um, dialogue to move the picture around. It means that the video will capture the motion. Um, so if I move the jaw horizontally or vertically um, or a combination of both, then the relative position of these three points stays the same. I, th I think that would be fairly obvious to you. And likewise if we rotate it the relative position of those three points stays the same. It should be fairly obvious, but as one or two people have questioned me on my, the math, I, I thought I'd better uh, point this out. Um, if we then go into looking how we capture that mathematically, what we would do is we would draw a line through the first two, the front two points, and uh, extend it backwards and then we would draw a perpendicular to that line down from the the axis to meet that line and then we would measure the distance from the axis to the point of intersection and then from the and we'd call that A and then we'd measure the distance from the point of intersection to the first point of contact on that rear molar and now we've defined relative to the front two points the front two teeth uh, we've defined the position of the axis. It's a distance B backwards along this line from the molar and a distance A up to the axis. Now let's move this diagram around and again we'll use the power point, point size and position control. So if we rotate that the diagram, if we uh, translate it, just move it with in different directions without rotation. Uh, you can see that um, maybe I should carry on this with this a little bit, so a bit more rotation perhaps. You can see that as we move it around, the line that we constructed, the lines we constructed stay the same. They don't change the distance from the motor to that point of intersection, from the point of intersection up here. Uh, those distances don't change. And so we know that if we know the positions of the two front teeth, 
and we have these measurements, then we can always calculate where the axis is going to be. The next point I want to illustrate is that there has to be some rotation, in most cases anyway, of the jaw when it moves from that uh, first point of contact in central relation into maximum intercuspation. So why is that? Why do I say it ha there has to be some rotation? Let's look at uh, a, I guess a basic slide. So we're, I'm showing an arrow here that suggests that this back molar slides up the uh, or along uh, the rear surface of one of the upper molars and so it's likely to be uh, about this angle a little bit up because it's working on the back slope of of the upper molar. Now if we say there is no rotation then what we're saying is that all parts of the jaw move in the same direction. So that means the top of the jaw or the condyle moves in the same direction and the same distance as the lower part. That's what we mean when we say there's no rotation or there's just a translation, it's all moving together. Well immediately you'll say, well, hey, looking at the eminence up here um, and the fact that there's a, an incompressible disc between the condyle and the eminence, there's no way that the condyle can move in that direction. The only way that we can get that lower, the, the, this lower molar to move in the desired direction is if the the jaw rotates enough so that the condyle doesn't um, try and push through the eminence or the temporal mandibular disc. And it really makes uh, doesn't make too much difference if I uh, substitute more horizontal lines you can still see we get the same problem in that the condyle is looking like it's going to bash into the eminence unless we do some rotation. So there seems to be a, an important point to stress because you'll see in the calculations I've performed that it takes account that there will be both uh, rotation and translation and we'll go into that in a bit more detail now. Now when we come to do the calculations, of course we need quite a few figures to determine where the, where the teeth are, where the uh, condylar axis is, and defining the, the motion that takes place between that first point of contact and maximum um, intercuspation. Now, I don't want to frighten you off by the number of figures here, uh, but I, I would hope these are quantities that you'll probably have a, a reasonable es able ability to estimate or, uh, or even measure with your patients. So I'm just going to run through them uh, now so that uh, you can see the basis of the calculations. I'm not going to try and go into the calculations on this video. Uh, you can download the calculations and spreadsheets that implement the calculations um, yourself and test it out on your, your own uh, measurements. Uh, but here, here are the basic measurements that are needed to nail this all down mathematically. So the first one is this length A. Uh, well, I perhaps should say, first of all, we construct this line, uh, like I showed you in the early part of the video, but construct a line, or imaginary line, that's going through a cont uh, the front tooth, uh, the top of the front tooth that will probably make contact here with the uh, some of the upper teeth. Uh, the first point of contact is another uh, point of interest. Uh, so we'll draw a line through those two points and then extend it out out as far as necessary to meet a perpendicular that goes up to the condyle. And therefore if you have measurements of where the condyle is or or, uh, or condylar axis is and can uh, translate that in, you know, using geometry into these figures, that, that's how you'll get them. Or just by estimating from, you know, eye or putting a ruler to somebody's head, again, you'll, you'll have a, a reasonable estimate. Uh, the purpose of this is really one of 
illustration as opposed to expecting you to use these calculations to plot exactly where the, the condyle is moving. Um, the idea is that you're going to put in uh, probably rough estimates of some of these figures just so that you can prove to yourself what's happening as a little variation in, in these figures doesn't change the net effect of the result that much. So um, these are the figures. So this length A is the distance down this perpendicular from the uh, condylar axis to this other line. Distance B is from the point of intersection to the back tooth. Uh, and then we need to, uh, just for mathematical exactness, uh, need to know some angles here. And so uh, the red figures are the figures that I'm saying um, determine the motion. So here we've got, we say that the back tooth moves a distance d um, and that that motion is in a direction of an angle delta to the horizontal, this line being a horizontal line. And then we say that uh, the this line that we constructed when the jaw closes, that rotates through an angle theta, ending up at some angle here, which is at an angle lambda to the horizontal. Uh, and so these are the figures that you would uh, enter into the spreadsheet that I'll provide and that are used to calculate what happens with the condyle. Okay, uh, there's one other thing I should say is that I have provided an alternative form of, uh, of the calculations because I decided that it might be difficult to estimate what this angle theta is. I, I don't know about you, but I'm not a great estimator of angles. I'm not sure if I could tell you the much difference between by eye to a rotation of one degree or three degrees, which can make a, a quite a significant difference to the calculations. So um, what I've done is provided an, an alternate set of calculations that instead use the distance, this distance e, that is moved by the that front tooth between uh, the initial position and the fin ending position, as I think that the distance is something you'll be much better able to estimate. Um, we still need an angle, uh, but that's more of a, a static angle. It's a bigger angle, perhaps easier to uh, get a number on um, of what that constructed horizontal line makes with the horizontal. Um, but that's it turns out in the calculations that's not so critical as long as we have this distance e. So again, to explain to you why uh, there are the two forms of calculation. Uh, the first set I came up because it seems logical to think about a rotation of an angle theta, uh, but that would be difficult to measure. The second set made the calculations more tricky, but um, using a distance e here uh, that the front tooth moves might be easier for you to, to figure out and put in. OK, so here's how things look in the sort of mathematical simplification of the situation um, that uh, you might, that you will see if you look at my calculations in detail. But the point here is, well, it's just to show you that here's here would be the starting position of our constructed lines. Here would be the ending position of the construction lines in um, in yellow, and that our goal is to determine where the condyle moves. So, what is the change of its horizontal position, its x coordinate, if you like? What is its change in the y coordinate? Uh, and I'll now show you some figures. Uh, of of the x coordinate because I think most people are convinced that the condyle must come down. Uh, the discussion is whether the condyle goes f backwards or forwards. What we have here are some figures or some results based on some trial figures. So what we said was that uh, A would be thirty millimeters, B forty millimeters. Uh, the angle the ending position makes with the horizontal is 7 degrees, the angle of the slide is 4 degrees, and then uh, what this table does is just show you 
uh, different results based on uh, looking at the slide and the rotation um, independently and that, that's something we can do mathematically you can uh, look at them each independently and then combine the two results to find the net effect so uh, here when we're looking at the distance D uh, of the slide um, these figures would represent millimeters so 1 to 10 millimeters uh, slide um, when we're looking at the angle of rotation these represent degrees 1 to 10 degrees of rotation and we can see then that um, for a 1 degree rotation the condyle would move backwards that's what uh, the negative is uh, positive is going forwards and to the, or to the right on this diagram backwards is going to the left or, or, or sorry negative is going to the left or backwards so the rotation always produces a backwards uh, component the the slide always can provides a forward component you can see that uh, the slide the contribution contribution of the slide to to this delta x is pretty well almost exactly the same as the amount of the slide that's because the angle delta is small and we're just taking this horizontal component of the distance d and that nearly with for small angles it's almost equal to d that's what we see in this column and with the rotation you see it goes from a negative 0.6 uh, backward effect for a one degree rotation up to minus 6.1 millimeters on a 10 degree rotation so assuming that you had a geometry that was something like this and you observed say a a two millimeter slide and a three degree rotation um, then you could combine these two figures the, the two millimeters forward 1.7 millimeters back so you get 0 0.3 millimeters forward would be the net effect if you had say a one millimeter slide but a four degree rotation then um, the net effect is going to be combining the one millimeter millimeter forward 2.3 millimeters backwards uh, net is 1.3 millimeters backwards so you can either use this table if you think you have geometries of about this size or you can use the spreadsheets that I'll provide to enter your own values and see how they work out